Whether we like it or not, anime and animation is becoming more and more mainstream with each passing day, so perhaps not surprisingly, it means changing viewing habits, preferences, interests and many other variables behind the scenes. And with an ever-increasing audience, there also comes one very important desire. Money! Right off the bat, I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to doomsay or gatekeep or anything even remotely close to that. My intention here is to lay out all the information and come to a conclusion on how that affects the everyday anime fan. If you're a seasoned viewer, you can most likely already name a few things that have happened in the industry that are a recent development. Things like seasons being split into two cores or parts, for example. There's no real reason to do that, especially if the length of time between the parts is the same as between seasons. Instead of calling them parts, they could just be season 1 and 2. But nevertheless, many big shows are now following this trend. Most of all, one of the biggest shows out there, Attack on Titan, which in almost meme-worthy fashion has been using the subtitle of the final season for 3 years running now. And as much as I love the series and it doesn't really affect me in any way whatsoever, it's a pretty transparent marketing stunt to get the eyes of more casual viewers simply by leveraging FOMO. Simulcasting English dubbed series is also a fairly recent development that, while still limited to big budget shows, has become much more widespread. Unlike some other factors that might not exactly have the consumer's best interest in mind, in my eyes, this is a net positive for the industry. As much as the sub versus dub debate has been raging on for as long as anime has been around, I think any reasonable person can see the benefit in having more accessibility. Whether it's for people with dyslexia or any other number of problems that might make it difficult for them to follow along with a subtitle series. Or simply them wanting to put it on in the background and not having to pay attention the entire time. And the most important factors, quality and availability. It's no secret that with the industry growing, the quality expectations have continued to grow alongside it. Which is of course, again, just a net win for viewers. Just looking at the budgets some of these series have nowadays, you should get a good idea of just how big the production studios are nowadays. Though with that comes the most pressing matter, availability. If you wish to make a high budget series, clearly you'd want as many eyes on it as possible to maximize revenue streams, right? Well, for a time not so long ago, if a series existed, there was a 99% chance possibility that you could watch it on Crunchyroll in its entirety. And that was considered as the gold standard. The thing to remember when it comes to services like Crunchyroll, hashtag not an ad, is that the network effect comes into play. Before the days of streaming services, animation studios would have to license out their productions to a few specific TV stations and that would be their primary source of revenue, with DVDs and merchandise coming sometime after that. This, by its very nature, of course drastically limits the potential audience the series might reach. Add piracy on top of that and your revenue sources are very limited. Though once a giant like Crunchyroll came into the picture, everything changed. Regarding the just mentioned piracy, the funny thing about it is that time after time it has been proven that the fastest way to curb online piracy is simply availability. If pirating something becomes more of a hassle than simply paying a fair price, a vast majority will stop pirating. Though the other massive leg up of Crunchyroll was the aforementioned networking effect. Unlike TV stations, Crunchyroll even in its early days was far more accessible and had a bigger reach right off the bat. And with that, once it begun buying up licenses, the network effect comes into play. Consumers see it as incredible value because it has so so many series for a single price. Word of mouth does its work and more and more people migrate to the site as the primary source for anime. On the flip side, producers see that Crunchyroll's a middleman is extremely effective in attracting a wider audience. And because they've already licensed many series and have a good reputation, anime studios now too begin looking toward Crunchyroll as a simple way to broaden their reach. And with that, the snowball effect begins. Consumers see the ever-increasing value in the service as its catalog begins to expand, not to mention the entirely new market in the West opening up as availability is no longer an issue. Meanwhile, animation studios can charge higher prices because Crunchyroll thrives on having all series available on its platform, thereby being able to increase production budgets, hire more staff, and essentially increase quality across the board. And in a short few years, 
the barrier to entry for another streaming service is so incredibly high that trying to rival the crunchy spring roll is just impossible. You simply cannot make a service with over a thousand series at a 5 euro price point overnight. And so, you either just continue feeding the snowball or, most likely, fall to the wayside because your reach is just so, so much smaller. Or rather, that's how it once was, because as many of you will know, things are not as simple nowadays. Enter Netflix. A once humble mail-based rental business turned streaming giant. Just like with Crunchyroll, here too we have to keep in mind the networking effect. Only with Netflix, there was a catch. It was bigger. Much, much bigger. It wasn't just us weebs who'd subscribe to get our fix of anime. It was your everyday Joe watching the near infinite amount of movies, TV series, or better yet, Netflix originals, which by their very nature meant exclusivity. And that's where things got complicated for everyone. Because with such a giant footprint on the streaming industry, why shouldn't Netflix leverage its market share and start buying up anime licenses? And how about making them exclusive? Oh, and how about making them conform to Netflix's binging style rather than the usual weekly format that has been going strong for many years? While there is a long, long list of various ways Netflix has shorthanded some series, there are a few very specific examples that are worth noting as the biggest offenders that illustrate the problem. The first and most well-known one at the moment has to be JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 6. For those uninitiated, first off, please watch JoJo, seriously. Though as with most series, for the entirety of its run, JoJo has always aired weekly. Even the term JoJo Fridays was coined by fans to signify the occasion. But then came in Netflix, who bought up the exclusive rights to JoJo Part 6. And so, the release schedule changed from weekly to a batch release. And the thing with these batch releases is that while they conform to the Netflix usual binge-style watching, they massively hurt hype and community engagement. And while the big smart contrarians will just say, well hey, just watch it weekly then, in my opinion, that is simply an ignorant oversimplification of the problem. When a show releases weekly, if you follow said show, there is a mutual understanding between fans that you can talk about everything leading up to that point in spoilery detail, discuss future events and everything else of that nature. It naturally breeds discussion, whereas with the Batch release, the first question to ask is, on what episode are you? What's the point in discussing that awesome fight in episode 5 if we're already on episode 12? That mystery in episode 3? I don't care about your theory because I already know the answer. For a long-running series to thrive, it needs community engagement that goes on continuously. There's a reason series like One Piece have been around for such a long time. There is always something new to discuss. Which leads me on to point 2. Hype. Releasing 12 episodes and going radio silent for like 5 months is just puzzling. Imagine two scenarios. 12 episodes released weekly, or a batch release of 12 episodes with 9 months between cores for both scenarios. In the first scenario, the wait is effectively only 6 months because the three of them have continuous releases. The latter, however, takes the full brunt of that 9-month wait, and naturally, a longer wait kills a lot of excitement for the story. Fact of the matter is, in JoJo's case, no matter how great the animation is, I can tell you right now, I am glad that I'd read the manga beforehand, because even knowing what happens next, it's just hard looking forward to events that I know everybody will blitz past, and once again find themselves waiting another 9 months for the next part. And on top of all that, the question of animation. What do you think is more difficult? Having a hard deadline of 12 episodes being ready on the same day? Or having the opportunity to work on finishing touches on the later episodes as they're still airing? And in Netflix's case, that deadline is likely even worse. Because these shows also come out dubbed already. Meaning that the real deadline is likely even further back for the dubbing to take place and to get the episodes ready for, again, the same day. Clearly the best scenario here is not the binge model. And as much as the frankly insane budgets nowadays help with outsourcing midframes and everything else of that nature, it still doesn't solve the issue of pushing already overworked animators to have so much content ready in advance. Though keep this question in mind for now. 
And lastly, Netflix executives, listen up. Because I'm about to share some top class economic skills and deep insights into how you can make three times, yes, you heard that right, three times the money. Retention. Imagine us JoJo fans desperate for content. Well, listen to this. If you released the episodes weekly instead of all at once, you'd get 12 weeks of revenue, three months of subscription, and three times the money. Just think about that. In a similar, yet also completely opposite vein, we have the case of Netflix Jail. A term coined by users to describe Netflix holding back series for months on end before releasing them in the West. For this case, Beastars is a perfect example of that. A series that was broadcast in Japan from October to December of 2019, but didn't arrive on Netflix until March of 2020. And while on a surface level that might just seem like an annoyance, it actually goes deeper than that. Because what do you think anime fans will do if you tell them, hey, this series is ready for you to watch, you've just gotta wait a couple months. Obviously, they will not wait. Instead, so they'll turn to piracy, fan subtitles, or any other means of seeing it while it's still airing in Japan. This, in turn, will have a significant impact on the series' performance once it is actually released, and lower analytics might doom the chance of a renewal on that basis alone. In the case of Beastars, there was enough hype behind it that it's still going strong, but hey, we know that Netflix is cutthroat when it comes to cancelling shows, right? Which brings me on to the final case of Netflix's release schedule. A series that was unfortunately not as lucky as Beastars and had perhaps the most bizarre release schedule of all time. The Great Pretender. From a personal standpoint, I think this was an absolutely fantastic series that will likely never see a continuation simply because of the level of mismanagement we saw with it. I'm even willing to bet that many of you will have never heard of it, despite it being an original story from Wit Studio. It had an early exclusive debut on Netflix Japan on June 2nd of 2020. But more importantly, it wasn't a binge model, nor was it a weekly model. It was a mix of both, where five episodes would be released every week for three weeks. One of those weeks was four episodes, but that's just a minor detail. Meanwhile, regular airing of the show began a month later on July 8th of 2020. As for the rest of the world, the 14 episodes that were dropped in batches in Japan were released all at once on August 20th of 2020, months before the show finished proper TV broadcasting. As for the latter half of the season, it too followed a very wacky three-way staggered release schedule where the releases basically differed by a month. I think no matter how you swing it, it's pretty easy to see why getting a community consensus on a series that has three different air dates is difficult to say the least. And not surprisingly, hype around it was nowhere to be seen. Especially because, similar to what we talked about with JoJo, the release of the second part of the season, which was actually just another arc and not really a season, was kept radio silent. Reporting around its release date was basically non-existent. So even if you wanted to know when it's coming back, it was never really clear. So, Netflix bad? Well, yes and no. As mentioned before, there are a variety of reasons to dislike Netflix for their practices, be it botched release schedules or having any form of exclusivity at all. Though on the other hand, they are bringing in a lot of money and a lot of people into the anime sphere. Gatekeepers will throw a hissy fit, but anime is becoming more mainstream, and that can only be a good thing for the industry all around. There's a reason why we now have series boasting $150,000 budgets per episode. A niche industry simply doesn't give you that. Let's be honest, Netflix is not going anywhere. If anything, it will just continue gobbling up IP after IP. Even as I'm writing this video, an entirely new Death Note live-action series is being produced. So, as much as there are downright mind-boggling decisions that may or may not literally doom an entire series and basically be them shooting themselves in the foot, I would still say that their presence is still a net positive on the industry. Though the problem with that statement is that we're merely looking at one facet of the entire problem. Because nowadays, we have entered an entirely different scenario. It's no longer just Crunchyroll and Netflix. Now we have several major players all trying to get a slice of the pie. 
And when it comes to these streaming wars, the effects on the industry become so, so much more dubious. Because there, we once again return to the problem of availability. Remember that the entire reason why Netflix became the giant that it did was because it removed the need to buy 50 separate channels on TV. Instead, you bought a single subscription and got thousands of ad-free movies and shows. But now that we have several major players, many once again find themselves subscribed to five or even more streaming services at the same time, essentially taking us full circle back to the cable days. And with that, people once again turn to piracy. So, why am I even going on about this entire thing? Well, the point I'm trying to get across is that with so, so many new players getting into the industry, accessibility will once again become a problem. Yes, we might get more big budget shows trying to tempt you into subscribing to another platform, but all of that will come at the expense of being able to watch it at all and under what circumstances. For example, if we take a look at the AMC model, a Net Amazon Crunchy subscription will get you one episode per week, but a Net Amazon Crunchy Plus subscription will let you stream them a week in advance or something like that. A larger barrier to entry and these other forms of exclusivity or early access just comes with splitting up the viewers into smaller camps and overall just hurting the community and by extension the value of the IP itself. And on the note of splitting up viewers, we have the biggest offender of all, movies and region locked releases. This is a facet of the industry that I think has undergone the biggest change in recent years, with basically every large IP now getting the theatrical treatments. And for us to get a better understanding of why, we have to look at the wonder boy of anime that is Demon Slayer. I'll keep my opinions on the series out of it, but the fact of the matter is, is that it is ridiculously popular. Like, inconceivably popular. For reference, according to several reports, the second season of Demon Slayer was literally pulling over 20% of all TV households in Japan. It held the top spot for 18 consecutive weeks and is literally the most popular TV show on streaming services among every single age demographic and gender in the country. So while it is also popular worldwide, Japan is a whole different ballpark. Everyone and their mom is watching Demon Slayer. Literally. And with that in mind, let us look at the Mugen Train movie that, don't forget, was released in the midst of a pandemic. But that didn't stop it. Like at all. Because it made $44 million in its opening week domestically, and a total of over $500 million worldwide. It literally outperformed the second place, Spirited Away, a movie that held the top spot in Japan for almost 20 years by over $100 million. But that's not all. Because when it came to America, it raked in another cool $19.5 million and set the record for the biggest opening for any non-English film released in North America. And with all that, it became the highest grossing movie of 2020. For some extra context, the budget for the film was a mere $16 million. The movie made over 30 times that. Obviously, compared to something like The Avengers, all of these numbers are still pretty small. But that really isn't a fair comparison, as those franchises have been going on for years, if not decades. Whereas with Demon Slayer, it is, by all accounts, an incredibly young IP. Though hearing these numbers, it's perhaps not surprising that a precedent was set. There was a mountain of money being left on the table. Creativity is one thing, but unfortunately, when it comes to financial decisions, that is no longer the biggest factor. Because when money is involved, suits move in. Think about it from the executive's perspective. What makes more sense? A long-running series that may or may not fizzle out as it goes on, or an immediate and guaranteed influx of cash. The movie format creates a massive financial incentive to move productions towards a movie-focused approach, and so why not do it? If your series is doing well, turn it into a hype fest for the upcoming movie, which will by default generate more hype than any single episode could and rake in those sweet dollary dues. Combined with the additional merchandise for the theatrical release, and you've got yourself a full house. But wait, I said it set a precedent, right? Well, I hear you ask, what about the countless movies we've seen already? 
One Piece, one of the biggest anime IPs of all time, has had literally 14 movies and you don't see anyone complaining. Well, that's the thing. Because so far, almost none of these films that were released parallel to the main series itself were ever canon. They were merely fun side adventures, but now, that is changing. Keep in mind that the Mugen Train movie was 100% canon to the point that it was repurposed as a separate TV broadcast arc later in its run. And following that, we have Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, another movie installment that came on the heels of Demon Slayer with a 100% canon story to the mainline series. Perhaps not surprisingly, with just how big Jujutsu Kaisen is, it has also made over $190 million worldwide. And while it is not nearly as much as the aforementioned Demon Slayer movie, it still shot up to the 7th spot of highest grossing Japanese films of all time, and set the record for the second highest opening weekend in Japanese film history after, big surprise, Demon Slayer. Budgets regarding the film are a bit more dubious than with Demon Slayer, but clearly 190 million worldwide covers that very, very comfortably. And then we enter the present day, where the trend has already begun to show itself. First off, we have the remastered Sword Art Online Progressive series, which, by all accounts, is just a better version of the original story. Just for some quick background if you're unaware, the anime series is notorious for blasting through the story at a ridiculous pace, which made many curious about all the things that happened during those countless time skips. And the progressive movies do just that. So in essence, if you now want to see the full, full story of Aincrad, you not only have to watch a movie, but what will most likely be a very, very long list of movies, with the second one being announced already. When it comes to numbers, SAO doesn't stand even close to the aforementioned shonens, though you have to remember that both Jujutsu Kaisen and Demon Slayer are more so outliers that simply set the stage for everything moving forward. So even if the progressive movies pull 19 million as they did with the first one, it is still extremely lucrative. Next up, we have the fairly recent announcement of the Kaguya-sama movie following its third season's incredible performance. Many of you will have likely heard at least of its name, considering all the drama that was around it supposedly dethroning Full Metal Alchemist on the top-rated anime list. But all of that aside, case in point is that it is ridiculously popular. And most importantly, this movie, largely functioning as a major, major climax of the story so far, and covering one of the most important arcs of the manga, will be 100% canon. So, you can likely imagine what its box office performance is going to look like. Yet again, a mountain of money. And a final example I want to offer up is the upcoming One Piece Red film. Unlike the aforementioned examples, just like the 14 other movies I mentioned before, this one is actually not considered to be canon, though it still has a major catch. Because unlike some of the other films that are essentially just a side adventure, this one is titled after one of the series' most mysterious and infamous characters. If you've never watched One Piece, this likely won't mean anything to you, but even with this movie technically not being canon, the pull of having Shanks on the posters alone is ridiculous. And even aside from that, the number of people still asking whether the movie is canon or not should already paint a clear picture of how strong of a pull it has already. While I was working on this video, more news came out regarding the One Piece film where, put briefly, we found out that a surprising amount of it is actually canon to the mainline series. This essentially just reinforces what I said before. Depending on how much canon material there really is, which we're not 100% sure of yet, just that some of it is, this may be required watching for basically anyone following the series. And with that comes potentially spoilery reveals and everything else of that nature. So, why do I bring all this up? Who cares that these movies are coming out? The crux of the problem here is once again availability. Remember all the talk we had around multiple streaming services and all that? Well, now add cinemas on top of that. Now you are not only being torn between multiple services, but if you want to keep up to date with the big names in the industry, you also have to go watch the movies, which further divide up the fan base by adding even more barriers to entry. And that's not all. Because remember the Netflix jail discussion? Well, here we have an even more pronounced version of that. 
because each and every one of the just mentioned movies had releases in Japan long before they ever came to Western markets. So now, it's not just the services holding back releases. It's region locking with zero way around it. No VPNs or anything will solve that problem. That is unless you fly to Japan to see the movie and you know perfect Japanese, but I'm a broke student so I won't be doing that. But okay, what's the problem with that? If everyone in the West has to wait, then the entirety of the Western fanbase will just become one major part of the community, right? Well, I never saw the Demon Slayer movie. I never saw the Sword Art Online movie. I won't see the One Piece Red movie. I will likely not see the Kaguya-sama movie either. Not because I didn't or don't want to, I really really do. But I couldn't and likely will not be able to. Why? Because it's a theatrical release. Only select cinemas ever aired it. And here in Latvia, not a single cinema in the country ever aired them. And I'm not alone. Take a quick look at places like Reddit and you'll quickly see that many many people cannot see the films even if they want to, simply because their cinemas do not air them. And so the only option for people like me is waiting for the Blu-ray release, which is likely another 6 to 12 months away after it comes to global markets to begin with. And at that point, everyone has moved on. So, where does that leave us? A community divided into haves and have-nots, where with canon material, a portion of it is either entirely cut off completely or will turn to piracy not because they want to, but because that's the only option. What I'm trying to say here is that so far, everyone has always been on the same page. Simulcasting was one of the biggest advances in anime, where everyone worldwide was watching the same thing, if not at the same time, then a few hours apart at the latest. And it's that shared community that propelled the industry forward. But now, we are once again going full circle. Availability is once again becoming the biggest problem in the industry. It's difficult for me to keep my opinion out of it because I've never been a fan of movies on a fundamental level, simply because I've always enjoyed long-form storytelling instead of just a two-hour block. But the thing that I can't help but think about with canon stories now also incorporating a movie approach is what that will do to said long-form storytelling. If you want to sell tickets, it's in your best interest to cook up that two-hour block as much as possible. So, will we see a trend of series merely building up to a climax that would take place in the movies? Obviously, there are some positives to such an approach. A bigger budget and higher quality animation being the most prominent ones. But, is that really what you watch anime for? Watching a 12 episode prologue just to go watch a movie after that may or may not be 5 months late? For me, that's not really it. One of the biggest things that anime, or any other form of media for that matter, does is bring people together. Whether it's to discuss the show, to theorize about upcoming events, to share their takeaways, to cosplay characters, and a long, long list of other social factors. For myself, and I'd wager many other content creators, that's the entire reason why we created our channels in the first place. To share our love of these IPs and to create a form of discussion. Everything we've talked about so far limits that. Whether it's the bash releases of JoJo dampening any excitement, or your most anticipated series being thrown in Netflix jail, or movies your country doesn't even air, each and every one of these practices hurts the community. And the primary motivator of all that? Money. And it's here where everything takes a very, very dark turn. Because when an industry is going as rapidly as anime and animation, the way these profits are enjoyed will no doubt become much more complicated. So far, we've mostly only focused on the consumer side. You, me, and the everyday weeb just wanting their fix of anime. Well, the thing is, we may be paying for multiple streaming services, movie tickets, merchandise, and all the other forms of monetization. But that money might not be going where you want it to. The anime industry is now worth almost 25 billion dollars. But why is it that even with these movies and long-running series bring in record profits year after year, we still have reports of terrible working conditions where the animators that are making all of that possible are working with lower wages than a McDonald's employee? As reported by Vox, in between animators who in most cases are freelancers, meaning they also have zero employee benefits, earn around 200 yen per drawing. 
that is less than two dollars. And the problem is that each and every one of these in-between drawings takes more than an hour. So an eight hour day brings in $16 max. Other reports detail working at Top Studios, where you'd imagine the insane profits brought in by the big names are also enjoyed by the animators. Well, that is not the case, as there too we hear of salaries being as low as $100 per month. Yet still, these people pour their hearts and souls into their work simply because it is their passion. Though as you know, passion won't stop you from needing sleep, food, and even basic necessities. In 2019, Studio Madhouse was accused of violating the labor code. Employees were allegedly working 400 hours per month and went 37 consecutive days without taking a single day off. The worst incident in 2014 involved a man allegedly working more than 600 hours in the month leading up to his death. I think you can fill in the blanks as to what happened there. In February of 2021, the New York Times put out another post detailing the horrors going on behind the scenes. This report detailed an interview with one of the big names in the industry, Tetsuya Akutsu, who's worked on several big IPs throughout his career. Though there too we hear of similar reports where working nearly every waking hour nets just $1,400 to $3,800. And that's with his well-known reputation. Though in spite of that, in interviews he states that he'd want to work in the industry for the rest of his life if possible. Similarly, just a month later in March of 2021, similar accusations were made against MAPPA, the studio behind massive titles like Attack on Titan, Jujutsu Kaisen, the upcoming Chainsaw Man, and many others. Here too the story is the same. Overworked animators living below the poverty line, where many describe the work environment as almost factory-like. In the same vein, another couple of months later, in July of 2021, almost identical accusations were made against Netflix. Here too, we see the same sentiments. The deeper problem here is twofold the overworking culture, and the sheer number of cannon fodder these studios have. Firstly, there's the belief that these horrible working conditions and even hospitalizations as a result of overworking are seen as a badge of honor. Nowadays, it's becoming a far bigger talking point in Western countries as the hustle culture takes hold. But once again, Japan is a whole different ballpark. Even a term has been coined to describe it, that when translated literally just means overwork death. And secondly, as also stated in the aforementioned reports, with the number of freelance workers lining up to work for these big studios, burnout is not a worry in the slightest. If an employee leaves, two more will take their place. And from the executive's perspective, it really is as simple as that. This is not a small issue. As detailed in the reports I just mentioned, it is an industry-wide problem. So the simple question arises, where is all that money going? Well, where do you think? I think using freelance workers because they can get around the labor code says enough already. Obviously, there are many other costs like voice actors, publishers, and everything else of that nature. But when it comes to the animators, their income ends with their drawing. No royalties, no revenue sharing, or anything like that. Fortunately, as this issue is finally becoming more and more widely reported, things may slowly be moving in the right direction. So, where do we go from here? Well, I don't have an answer to that, and I don't think anyone does really. But there is one thing that I think is worth acknowledging, or at least thinking about. We, the viewers, may be displeased about all the business practices we just talked about. The staggered releases, region locking, etc. Maybe this is me just being naive, but I think a bigger change is coming. More competition has only ever benefited everyone involved. So my hope is that with these major players coming into the anime sphere, all the labor problems will simply be too big to brush under the rug and new regulations will be necessary, which will hopefully curb the toxic work environments we hear of nowadays. At the end of the day, the shows we love so much are artistic expressions. So just imagine what they'd look like if the workers that made all of that possible were properly compensated. Will I complain about not being able to see my favorite movies? Sure. Will I complain about the release of Jojo Part 6 being mismanaged? Always. But I think all of that is a small price to pay for what will hopefully benefit everyone in the long run. So if you take away anything from all this, 
The next time you hear a show taking a prolonged break, or even a mangaka going on break, or anything along those lines, be glad, because they sorely need it. And when you see entitled people complaining about those delays, try to educate them, because talking about the issue is the only way to solve it. Regardless, the industry is changing. Right now, it may seem like more bad than good, but what it looks like in the future is yet to be seen. Crunchyroll changed the game once, Netflix changed it again. So who knows what might be just around the corner. And that's the video. A much, much different one from my usual content, so I'd love to hear any and all thoughts you might have on this sort of format. But with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.